thank everybody for coming out this morning. We're going to start with our invocation and welcome from the city. It's going to be delivered by Honorable Bill Tate, Mayor of Grapevine, and also a member of the First Baptist Church here. Thank you for organizing this. Uh, I've been trying to get out of town for several weeks. I was waiting on a grandbaby that was overdue. Finally got that last week. I wanted to leave town this weekend, but I just couldn't miss this. So, uh, sooner or later, maybe Memorial Day, I'll get down to my ranch and take care of my business down there. But it's this is a great uh, celebration. Uh, these women have been unrecognized for, for a long, long time. And so it's my honor to welcome you to Great Mine and to the cemetery here. Uh, Great Mine's a pretty old city for this part of the country, but when you talk about the mothers of the soldiers of the Civil War, you're talking about uh, back to the dawn of the 19th century. You're, t you're talking about a long time ago. A lot of these women came with the Peters colonies, and some of them came after Reconstruction, uh, after the war, but they all uh, played a major role in laying the foundation for our community and giving us the opportunity for what we have today. And so. We are eternally uh, grateful for these women. We can only imagine what the hardship, hardships uh, that they had to endure uh, throughout their life. It had to be a pretty primitive uh, life around here back then. And uh, uh, we, we should have, we, we should honor our women uh, more often than we do. And uh, I, uh, it gives us an opportunity to reflect back, too, I think, uh, about what the Civil War did to women. You know, it got them out of the household and uh, uh, gave them some uh, independence. They, they had to assume it, and they felt real strong about the war. Uh, a lot of Southern women uh, made it known that they wouldn't uh, date or marry a man if he didn't volunteer for the war. And when uh, the 100 men rode away uh, from this area, uh, with uh, under Gano's command, uh, the, the women were there to see them all to make sure uh, they went and did their duty. And so it was a great opportunity, I think, for for, for women uh, and part of their equality and their uh, strength today uh, originated from that period of time. The, we had some families here. The Nash family sent uh, two sons to fight in the Civil War. They both returned. Uh, the Hudgens family, uh, Mr. Hudgens, Reverend Hudgens, he founded the Matthews Church. He owned the land down uh, around uh, the railroad track and where the Matthews Church is today. And he provided land for that and for the Masonic School. But they sent three sons to fight in the Civil War, and only one returned. Uh, one of them died from disease and was buried on the uh, fork of a creek in Arkansas and another uh, died from his wounds and buried in a military uh, cemetery, I believe, in Mississippi. But uh, the women of this area uh, did uh, make a lot of sacrifice. Uh, I uh, think I had uh, probably family that fought on both sides of the war. And it was a war between families and a war between states and a war between nations. It took a half a million lives, 70% of the Union soldiers, the other approximately 30% were Confederate. A lot of them died from disease. Uh, it was a horrible, horrible time in our history, but it is a part of our history, and we should forget it. Uh, our community has been a part of that. Uh, the flag of the Confederacy flowed over our post office here during the war. The war began, uh, we were about 18 years old. Uh, and so uh, this area was a big part of Texas involved in the war. And these women, we should, uh, we should not forget them and we should honor them. My grand, great grandmother uh, pioneered to Texas after the war. She was born in Utaway, Tennessee. And she was not unlike so many women of that period of time. She never read the Bible, she never read a newspaper, she never read a recipe. She never wrote a letter, she never signed her name. She was illiterate. And so when they came, they lost all contact with the people back. 
Derek could be the car spot, uh, about better. And they were separate, she never returned, and uh, the families were separated for over 100 years. And that's not unlike so many families that were separated by the war and the constant time later. I had the privilege to go back to Wake Tennessee two years ago. Saw the little country church where she went to school, or uh, went to church when she was a kid. Saw the graveyards there, and boy, you're talking about old. Uh, it goes back to the days of the revolution there. But it really brought things uh, home to me, uh, uh, how difficult it was for people here, because so many of them, 40% of them were illiterate, especially the women. So they, uh, they dealt with that and the new responsibility the war brought on. So uh, they're, they're great American heroes, and they're heroes of our community, and they're part of our heritage. So will you pray with me? Oh God, merciful God, we pray that we might honor the women buried in our community who endured the hardships of the Civil War. Their courage and determination, their sacrifice and suffering, the unknown that they experienced, their ability to adapt to a change in situation, the necessity to learn new skills and assume new responsibilities. We honor all of the women of that terrible war, those who had to take over and run family businesses and family farms, those who had to milk the cows and plow the fields and reap the harvest, those who had to become nurses and administer to wounded troops, those who had to knit the socks and sweaters and coats and weave the blankets for the troops. All of those who assume these new roles while at the same time raising kids and educating them and seeing that they were clothed and fed. It was a time when women, women began to manage their own financial affairs and express their opinions and reveal their strength. Only you, Father, know what these women endured during that period in our history. We pray for those mothers and sisters and wives of the hundred men that rode away from this community to fight under Gato's command. We pray for those who endured the war in other states and then pioneered to our community after that war was over. We pray, Father, that they rest in peace and that their souls are safe. And finally, Father, we pray that we might continue to heal and forgive. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> Is Joanne Stanley here? I don't think she made it. Tommy, would you do us a welcome to the Great Valley Historical Society, please? <laughs> have become a member of the Great Valley Historical Society here. My mother died uh, six years ago. And my mother was so interested in this. And, I never, before that period of time, even thought about the history. Well, when I'd go to the show up here in the Grapevine, and I think probably it costs, I remember 14 cents, but Bill probably remembers 10, 10 cents. <laughs> they, had, they had cowboy movies that seemed like they were the predominant movie, you know, and and I, we lived that history through this. But they were talking, the people that were doing these movies were talking about things that had happened. And I'm sitting here watching cowboy movies, okay? And I think it's uh, almost prehistoric, you know, because we've already got an automobile, and, you know, horses, you know, had, had gone. I remember a mule being uh, used to haul a trailer that had a middle busted plow on the back of it, and that's about it. And all of this is so distant to me, but uh, in trying to figure out about it, you know, I'm sitting here and, and I finally realized that my grandfather was here, B.R. Wall was here, and they came from an era that that's that was their era so their parents were really this history and it made me say you know this isn't prehistoric it's historic and uh, kind of got me interested in it and uh, 
Michael has a website that is phenomenal about keeping track of the people in this area and uh, you know their, their lineage and everything else and I've gotten so interested in it and I would hate to quote any of it in that I uh, have I'm illiterate almost in that respect but uh, we had from this era area here we had Qualls and we had General Gano that formed a nucleus here. This this area was Indian fighting territory. And when they went off to war, it was you know, it was second thought to them. I mean they were at war almost here. And when they go off to war, the people that fought were uh, proud to see Texans because they knew that they knew how to get around and, and uh, handle uh, difficulties and everything else. So uh, I, the Historical Society of Grapevine is trying to <coughs> maintain that history and uh, encourage you to join or whatever and, and get involved and come to some of our meetings. We try to <coughs> propagate people and what has happened around Grapevine and the Grapevine has a tremendous <coughs> history and uh, that's it off the fly I could probably <laughs> <laughs> keep y'all out here for a little bit thank you appreciate y'all well, as far as we know this is the first time anybody any organization has ever done a Mother's Day ceremony like this one we did it this weekend so it wouldn't interfere with Mother's Day next week. We're going to honor today the pioneer ladies buried here who were mothers or mothers-in-law or grandmothers of soldiers in either one of the armies during the Civil War. These were strong women of character and faith. We're going to sing a song in their honor adapted from a hymn written in 1849 in England called Faith of Our Fathers. Kyle Lewis is going to lead us. This is an all sing. Remember the skating rink when we had all skate? <laughs> this is all sing. You got one of these? The first know one, faith of our mothers. Yes. Ready? Yeah. Here we go. Faith of our fathers. Three Confederate soldiers in this cemetery, ten Union soldiers, and there are also two memorial stones here for somebody who's not buried here. That's called a cenotaph for two Confederate soldiers who were killed in Georgia, were buried on the battlefield. 
when we began planning this project, two of the ladies were in unmarked graves, and we cooperated with family members and, and uh, to get them marked with new granite stones. They're back out there. One lady had the lower half of her stone, but the upper half of it, the half of her name on it, was missing. And with the help of her family members, we made her a new stone, too. And then Sean Partee and I, when we were installing it, we found the upper half that was missing, buried right beside it. Many of you here today know what it is to be a mother, but think about the conditions under which these ladies gave birth. Most of them had their children in log houses. Probably most of them only had midwives or family members to help with the births. Most of them worked on their farms and in their homes right up to the day they went into labor. And in just a few days, they got up and went back to work. Most people then had never even heard of the germ theory. They had only basic medicines that might have worked, might not have worked. Some of them lived in areas where the Indians were still a threat. Some of them lived in places where the little kids were in danger from bears and panthers and snakes all the time. <coughs> Most of them had windows with no glass, which means lots of flies and mosquitoes. Nobody had running water or indoor plumbing or washing machines or electricity. You traveled as fast as you could walk or as fast as your horse could walk. Many of these ladies lived in isolated mountain valleys, which they might leave, not, might not leave for years at a time. It's amazing that these ladies survived what they did, and then on top of that, they came to Texas, walking or riding a horse or riding in a wagon full of horses or mules or oxen. Why did people go places in oxen, wagons, out west? They were stronger than horses and Indians didn't want them. Indians wouldn't come and steal your oxen. These 20 women that we're talking about gave birth to a total of at least 167 children and were stepmother to 25 more. The oldest died at the age of 97, youngest at the age of 44. The average age of death for these ladies was 82. Amazing. Thank you. It would be impossible to overstate the good influence these fine ladies had on their kids and grandkids. We're gonna now sing a second hymn called How Firm a Foundation, first published in 1787. Well known to nearly everybody buried here and to most of us too. It was the favorite hymn of General Robert E. Lee, and they sang it at his funeral. It speaks of the foundation given to us by the Word of God, but it can also be a tribute to the good starts in life our mothers gave us. Ah. biographical information, it'll have photographs, 
documents. If you'll send me your email address in an email to me, I'll be sure you get an online copy of it when it's ready. My email address is on one of the sheets you have. And just email me now and I'll put it on the list. You'll get it when it's finished. The first three of these ladies were born while George Washington was the President of the United States. Mary Taylor Levice was the grandmother of two Confederate soldiers. Another of her grandsons wound up being the first mayor of Grapevine, Bart Starr. Eleanor Hayes Lawrence and her family came here from Jacksboro just before the war to get away from the Indian dangers there. She had at least two sons and one son-in-law in the Confederate Army. Mary Birch Wallace had at least two grandsons in the Confederate Army and both of them are buried here close to her. Mary Coble Williams had two and probably a third son in the Confederate Army and a daughter who married a local Confederate. Nancy Dunn, Tommy's ancestor, and her family were among the charter members of the Baptist Church here. She had five sons who served in the Confederate Army and at least three daughters who married Confederate soldiers. On top of that, both of her grandfathers were soldiers in the American Revolution. Mom's uh, dad and dad's dad. Ann Burgoon had three Confederate sons and at least three Confederate sons-in-law. And all six of them made it back to Grapevine alive. Elizabeth Carbon had four Confederate sons, one of whom died in a Yankee prison camp in Illinois. She also had two Confederate sons-in-law. And then she had a daughter who married a Union soldier named Hiram Hurst. But they stayed in Tennessee. Hiram and his wife stayed in Tennessee. One of his brothers wound up coming here, one of Hiram's brothers, William L. Hurst, who was a Confederate soldier, came here in 1870 and wound up getting the city of Hurst named after himself. Hmm. Angeline Starr, Mary Levice's daughter, was a charter member of the Methodist Church here. Angeline had two sons who fought for the South and five of her daughters married Confederate soldiers. Her youngest son was too young to fight, but he made up for it by becoming the first mayor of Grapevine. Millicent Lipscomb and her family were founders of the Church of Christ here. Three of her sons and three of her sons-in-law were Confederates. All 20 of the ladies we honor today are buried in this general area of the cemetery, except Millicent Lipscomb. She's buried way about a quarter of a mile down there at the south end. And that's because she was buried in a cemetery on the airport land. And when the airport was built in the late 60s, they moved everybody. And the spaces that were available were in the new part. So she's wound up buried down there away from everybody else. So we did her a little setup right here. Rebecca Proctor had at least two sons who fought for the south, and one of them is buried here near her. Annie Simpson lived here during the war years, but most of her kids were grown when she moved here. Some of them stayed up north. One of them was a Yankee soldier who came here after the war for a few years and then went to Oklahoma. Lucinda Saunders had some interesting family reunions. She had a son and one stepson in the Confederate Army. She had three daughters who married Confederate soldiers and two daughters who married Union soldiers. <laughs> All of them wound up here at Grapevine. Sally Moorhead had no children of her own, but she raised three stepchildren. The son was a Confederate cavalryman, and the daughters both married local Confederate soldiers. Fanny Estel had 11 kids, but six died when they were very small. One of her sons was a Confederate soldier, and one of her daughters married one of the daughters of Millie Lipscomb. She had one son who was shot to death in 1900 when she was an old woman and uh, so she lost seven of her 11 before she died. She only had four left when she, was, when she died. Minerva Pearson also had a divided family. She had a union son, a union son-in-law, and a confederate son-in-law. Most of Sarah Morrow's children were too young to take part but her oldest son was a confederate soldier who never came to Texas to live. She had a son too young to fight who owned a bank here during the Depression, Bob Morrow. If you're an old grapevine old-timer, that has a meaning to you, Bob Morrow's bank. Elizabeth Nash, whose home is now the Nash Homestead, of which everybody is very proud, 
had no sons old enough to fight, but her daughter married a Georgia cavalryman named Bailey Payne, and he's buried here. If you go to the Nash Farm and look around, there's a little cemetery out on the north edge of the Nash Farm. There's two little kids buried in it, and it's it's the Nash's Payne grandchildren, two of Bailey Payne's little kids. Charlotte Jenkins also had no sons old enough for service, but her daughter married a Texas <laughs> cavalryman. He, she married Jacob Moorhead, whose stepmother you just met. <coughs> Sally Foster married a man, get this, who already had 14 children. First wife had seven, second wife had seven. And then she and Mr. Foster had, guess how many? Seven. Ten. Oh. <laughs> Five of her stepsons fought for the Confederacy and her one Confederate son-in-law, Henry Bennett, is Mayor Tate's great-grandfather. And so handsome. <laughs> He is. What happened? Who may have <laughs> she's talking, No offense. She's talking about that soldier. She loves oh. that picture of that soldier. <laughs> the mayor's <laughs> handsome too. <laughs> the last of the 20 ladies was Sally Hudgens, whose family was instrumental in founding the Methodist Church here. When she married Mr. Hudgens, he was a widower with seven children. She and Mr. Hudgens had an additional eight. Four of her stepsons served the South. Uh, the two oldest ones died while they were in the service. The two younger ones got back and had families here. And she also had a stepdaughter who married a Confederate veteran here named Joe Willis. And he walked around as an old man on the streets of Grapevine with wearing the gray. So there it is in a nutshell. The 20 ladies we're honoring today. There are doubtless others out in here in unmarked graves that we don't know about children and grandchildren who knew and loved them had an assurance of being able to see them again after they died and we as Christians have that same promise in our own generation we're going to sing one more song when we all get to heaven we have to remember now after that we're going to fire a musket salute to the ladies and the soldiers buried here and after the third volley our benediction is going to be led by John Mollett, the senior pastor of the First United Methodist Church of Grapevine. And when he is finished, we are dismissed. Thank you again. I want to say thank you to some people. Otherwise, they wouldn't get done. My sister, my mother, Tammy and Doris Patterson, my grandson, Sean Partee, James Alderman, and my wife, Marilyn, and Katie Lewis. Thanks to you guys for helping us get those rocks here and getting them put in the ground and some other logistics. To the Grapevine Historical Society, they let me do a program about this earlier this week. To Mayor Tate and the City of Grapevine for coming out and for supporting us when we want to do public service things here. We're going to do another one on Veterans Day. November, we're going to be in a parade. To the members of the Sons of Confederate Veterans, and there are several of us here in the E.W. Taylor camp. Is there anybody here from, I know there are Daughters of the American Revolution ladies here one at least. What about Daughters of the Confederacy? Very good. So thank you folks for coming and to the members of the First Baptist Church here, the First United Methodist Church here, Grapevine Church of Christ, and the Bedford Church of Christ for sending members to help us with this ceremony and to help us with our singing. Mike, you got the Sons of the American Revolution. And the Sons of the American Revolution. Ah. <laughs> Two. I miss anybody else? All right, thank you, Kyle. <coughs> sing the wondrous love of Jesus, sing His mercy and His grace. In the mansions bright and blessed, He'll prepare us a place when we all
hand trim. Shoulder arms. Right face. Let us pray. We give you thanks, dear Lord, for the mothers and the fathers of our lives, for those who have given us love and nurture, who have given us a background that has enabled us to live the lives that we live today. And Lord, we leave, leave this place, but not the memories. And we will remain thankful for their lives and remember them daily as they have given us the life that we live today. We pray this in the name of Christ our Lord. Go in peace. Amen. 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 Amen.